There's also the Southbridge thing um, with some functions. PCI bus, a standard slow old PCI bus. Uh, something called the SM bus, system management bus. I'm going to um, uh, get back to that in just a bit. We have LPC, low pin count, which was created to replace the ESA bus, ISA bus. Uh, and uh, PCI and LPC, they both look just like they were attached directly to the CPU. They still work the same way this bus does as far as software knows, anyway. The Southbridge can have a PS2 port and it can have um, uh, an SPI port or an SPI bus master. And on the PCI, there's usually some USB or IDE and, well, I guess both um, integrated. And uh, then there's this guy, the boot flash. That's the flash chip where we have the firmware stored. Remember in the 1980s picture, we had a boot ROM up there, it was connected directly to the CPU, but um, nowadays it's a little bit further away. <laughs> However, it's still accessible when, when the system powers up, it's, it's still there, the CPU fetches the first instruction when uh, starting to execute. So there's, uh, when, when all these components turn on from reset, uh, they, or come out of reset, they will be set up so that when the CPU accesses the special magic reset vector address, top of four gigs, it's going to be decoded to the, the boot flash chip down there, and all the components along the way have to play along. So this is connected to multiple places because um, sometimes it's uh, connected to LPC directly, the flash chip. Sometimes there's this SPI uh, bus master inside the south bridge, but sometimes there's also this Super I.O. chip, which does a lot of other stuff. And it can have a, an SPI master over here, and then the boot flash can be connected through there instead, and over LPC, and yeah, all the way up. And this can be a lot of fun. Uh, on, um, during my, my time hacking on Flash ROM, I, I discovered that, mm, okay, so decoding works by default. That's fine, it's, it, it comes up the right way. But this SPI master, it's, it's kind of limited. SPI supports uh, 16, uh, 16 megabytes of address space, but one Super IO vendor uh, decided to save on four of those bits in the register space, so you can really only access half a megabyte of flash chips instead of 16. So that's, that's too bad if you wanted to upgrade your flash chip. Um, Back to this SM bus thing, and I'm also going to, to talk about why I color-coded this. Uh, I don't know how well you can make it out, but this is green anyway. That's probably easy to see. Uh, most of the stuff up there is black, and there's some red uh, over there, the RAM, that memory controller, the North Bridge, PCI Express, the South Bridge, uh, these parts except for the LPC, which is, is black, and all of the Super I.O. stuff, if it's there, is also red. And everything that's red in this picture is, is stuff that Coreboot needs to touch and needs to configure. Whereas the black stuff just works, works on its own and the, the flash chip is blue because, well, it's a nice color and, and it's a little bit special. Um, that's where we, where we are. Uh, but uh, the, the red stuff, so, and uh, I, by far the most um, interesting challenge is this memory controller guy here, because this uh, uh, thick red line is getting, um, uh, is, is, is getting a lot of development. It started out being connected directly to the, with the, the RAM chips being connected directly to the CPU, and now we have DDR3. And I, DDR3, is, I haven't read enough about that, but DDR2, at least, is, is running so quickly that in order to, um, to do the RAM or the memory controller initialization, you have to use a brute force search to find the correct timing adjustments uh, that the memory controller is going to use when it's talking to the RAM, uh, the RAM module, the DIM, um, to, to uh, uh, compensate for 
how the main board was designed and how the tracks are laid out on, on the board. So that's a lot of fun and it's, it's getting really complex. And all of those, uh, uh, all of that configuration here at, at this memory bus thing is also highly dependent on the DIM. Um, so where's that information stored? Well, it's stored in these green little SPD boxes on the DIM. Um, and um, of course, we're here in, in the boot flash, and, but well, we're running in the CPU from the boot flash and we have to go out on this green bus and, and read the, the contents of this small little EEPROM on the, um, this green SPD EEPROM to find out how we're going to program the memory controller so that it can drive that particular RAM module uh, on the wide red uh, link. And uh, of course, we have to set up everything else as well. We have to set up uh, these, they're also red, it's difficult to see, maybe uh, the hypertransport connections between the CPUs, as well as to the north bridge, and set up the north bridge so that it, it properly separates the PCI Express from what is supposed to go to the south bridge, address decoding and speeds, um, the link speeds need to be set up, and. In the south bridge, same for PCI, the PCI bus, and um, uh, PS2 is, is, is comparatively simple. SM bus needs a, a bit of setup. You need to uh, wait until there's a, a stable clock on this green bus. Super IO, all of these functions, they have, um, uh, well, most of these functions, let's see, serial, parallel, watchdog, uh, maybe GPIO, and the floppy drive anyway, they have um, I.O. ports that need to be set up and they have interrupts that need to be set up and they might even have a DMA uh, configuration that is, is uh, necessary to be programmed elsewhere in the system so that um, whenever uh, something happens over here, the CPU will actually notice. So that's the core boot task. And in the source tree, there's um, a couple of subdirectories, four at the moment. There's been a lot of restructuring uh, over the last year. Um, maybe, yeah, yeah, pretty much over the last year. I'm going to talk a bit about that uh, soon. But some, example of, uh, some examples of files you can find in the source tree. Uh, you have, a, uh, first of all, the source directory. That's the big, that's, that's where all the fun stuff is. Uh, it has a couple of subdirectories, uh, CPU, Super IO, Console, Northbridge, Southbridge, Mainboard, Devices, Lib. Uh, it probably has a few subdirectories still uh, more, but these were the, the, the most interesting ones, I think. For example, that CPU x86 16-bit reset 16 ink, that's the reset vector, so that's uh, the very first instruction that the system is going to execute when it comes out of reset. It moves on and uh, then it comes to the cache as RAM uh, file and both those two files are uh, written in assembly language but um, those are the only ones. Cache as RAM, how many know about cache as RAM? About 10, okay. So cache as RAM is a neat trick um, in Pentium processors and later the reason these are in assembly is because there's no memory, right? We need to configure this, uh, this wide red link before we can use, actually use some RAM. And C code uh, or C compilers are um, uh, sort of, they rely on RAM being available and RAM being uh, online, connected, running. So we can't really compile any early code with a C compiler because there's no RAM, so the code won't run. And the trick is to use cache as RAM instead. So we're using part of the cache memory, which is on the CPU die, as RAM. Um, you can set it up so that it doesn't clear and um, uh, invalidate the cache, clear out the memory or clear out the contents. And you don't have a lot of space, but you have enough to, to actually run C programs if they're carefully, um, carefully built or compiled. So the next 
final.